Well, welcome everyone. We're delighted you're here. Uh, this study uh, grew out of our work at Fuller School of Psychology and obviously the grant of the Science of Intellectual Humility. And uh, we began to wonder uh, about the development of intellectual humility. How do, how do children receive uh, information from others uh, and what kind of judgments do they make about that? So uh, what we uh, wanted to do was uh, create some, uh, to test whether it made a difference about the moral character of the uh, informant. Uh, did the children make a differentiation on uh, whom they trusted uh, based on the moral character or the moral uh, violations and actions of the informant? And uh, eventually, uh, the, the test was that we gave them, uh, the children, we showed some scenarios of moral violations, which I'll go through in a minute. Uh, and then we had the children um, uh, look at an, an unidentified object has no name and and then what they would one of the we, we have, would have presented two scenarios one one kind of moral violation and maybe a conventional violation uh, or uh, th there were two different scenes anyway and they had to pick between which informant and the, the informant uh, would give them different names for this unidentified object and then they had to choose which one they trusted what who had the right name and it was a forced choice so uh, this is one of the objects we used. Apparently it's a, uh, a cover of a, of a shaver, but who knew? Anyway, <laughs> um, so what I'm going to go through in the first part, Matt will talk more about that uh, part of the study, uh, but before we could um, ask them, whom do you trust, uh, we had to find out if the scenarios we were presenting were truly moral violations in, in their mind and in children's minds. Uh, and did we have some differential uh, uh, assessments of, of these actions, some being moral and some being non-moral. So I'll go through how we determine that and, and then Matt will go through the uh, other study. So the first study was to pilot this, uh, these different scenarios to see if they rose to the level of what you would call moral violations. and. Uh, uh, we were sort of had two competing theories going uh, about what is a moral violation. One was Jonathan Haidt's theory, uh, the moral foundations theory, and, um, and the other was social moral theory. And according to Haidt, we, we make uh, sort of intuitive judgments um, based on sort of five different categories, and I'll go through those five categories in a minute. Uh, and, and then we, after we have in a sort of gut level intuitive reaction to the violation that we see, uh, then afterwards we reason, sort of post hoc, about uh, uh, that judgment. So the judgment's sort of emotional, intuitive, and then post hoc we, we give reasons for why we thought that was a moral violation. But social moral theory says um, there's a clear distinction uh, between certain actions, some are moral, considered moral, others are considered conventional, and we sort of reason about that. We, we consider harm care issues and justice fairness issues as moral violations, our children do, and then, but they distinguish those from just more conventional violations like uh, wearing the wrong clothes or uh, not saying thank you. So um, we're, we're, we sort of have competing theories and, and we wanted to see uh, which, if we gave scenarios uh, based on these two different theories, what would the children consider a moral violation and what would they consider conventional? Um, so what is moral? The questions we, we would ask, we would show these scenarios uh, with certain violations, and again, I'll go through those in a minute, and we would ask, ask them, was the action wrong? Was it bad to do what they did? And then they would say, it was good or bad. It had to be, in order to be moral, it had to be wrong. The child had to say it was a serious violation. They had to say that it was wrong even if a parent said it was okay to do. It was still wrong, even if like a teacher said, yeah, you can do that. No, it's wrong, they would say. Um, an action would be, have to be wrong independent of any rules. Like what if they lived in a country 
where this, was, this action was okay to do, where it was okay to push somebody down uh, to get ahead in line. Well, no, it, it would still be wrong. Um, so an action had to be wrong at all times and all places, it had to be wrong independent of rules, and then it had to deserve punishment. So when uh, actions were rated highly on all these categories, when basically when kids said uh, all these things, uh, that would rise to the level of a moral violation. Um, so that was according to social moral theory. So we use that framework. Uh, then the, the, you get, when you collect the, the, uh, the, rate, the ratings of the kids, then you get a generalizability score. And generalizable, but something's generalizably wrong when it's independent of permission of authority, rule, or knowledge of the rule, and independent of context, and deserves punishment. And they're conventional when they are dependent on permission of an authority, rule, or knowledge of the rule, and are context dependent and do not deserve punishment, like wearing pajamas to school uh, is, is a violation of, of, a, of a rule, but it, the rule could be different in a different place and time. So we were interested, uh, do children find violations of the five height moral foundations uh, uh, impermissible or bad? That had never been tested according to, um, we sort of overlaid the Smetna questions on to um, height's five, five moral foundations. Are their judgments dependent on rules or authority? Or are their judgments generalizable? And how do these judgments of the five foundations of moral intuitions compare to judgments on convention, conventional issues? So become a little more clear when I actually show you the, the sort of instruments. But uh, so there, there are, uh, we have, uh, we came up with eight or 10 scenarios that we tested. And we were interested, uh, did the kids consider these wrong? And according to moral foundations theory and social moral theory, harm, care, and justice, fairness should be morally wrong, should be found to be morally wrong by children. In moral foundations theory, it's two of the five. So justice, fairness is, is one. Uh, harm, care is another of the foundations. And in social moral theory, that is what constitutes uh, a moral violation. When children rate these violations as wrong, even as young as three. So they're clear about these actions being wrong. So here's a scenario on harm care. The, the young boy in the back of the, the green uh, shirt wants to get ahead. Uh, he's anxious to get out and get into recess. So he pushes Sally down uh, so that he can get ahead of her and Sally gets hurt. Uh, but Joey gets out the door faster. So and then we ask the kid, is, is this wrong? How wrong is it? Is it bad? Is it, uh, is it bad? What if there was a country where you could push people down, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and then the justice fairness scenario was uh, Joey was hungry. He saw an apple on the desk. It didn't belong to him. It belonged to Johnny. Uh, but uh, Joey took it anyway. Nobody was around. And he ate the apple. And so then we ask uh, those, that series of questions to, to see what the kids say. And generally, they found these as, as uh, wrong. Um, so uh, there are these matters of convention, though. Uh, and according to moral foundations theory, um, some of these, what might look like conventions to us, are actual moral violations. But according to social moral theory, it's really just harm, care, and justice, fairness that are wrong, and these other social conventions uh, uh, are considered conventional non-moral violations. So these are the conventional violations that we tested with the kids. Uh, Susie wakes up and, and uh, in her pajamas, she loves her pajamas so much she decides she's going to wear it to school, um, and so she gets on the bus and goes to school in her pajamas. And then we ask, how wrong is this? Uh, is it wrong in all times and in all places? Uh, so um, then there's a sort of third layer. So we have sort of three categories. We have these moral violations. We have these conventional violations. 
But then there, there were three of Height's moral foundations that we weren't sure were really moral. Did they rise to the level of moral? And those would be purity, sanctity, uh, and we tested this by having a kid uh, uh, throw an apple uh, away, or look for an apple. He found an apple in the garbage. He decided that he was hungry, and so he was going to eat the apple, even though it had been in the garbage. That's, yeah, so your moral intuitions are, are firing on all cylinders. Um, uh, also, I said, besides harm care and justice fairness, now those two are are the two of the five. Uh, purity sanctity is, is another moral foundation that we have intuitions about. In-group loyalty is also one. The way we tested this one was um, Jack on the end of the line with the green shoes really likes the people in the blue team um, and uh, he wants them to win even though he's on the yellow team. So he lets go of the rope on the yellow team and the blue team wins. So Jack goes celebrates with, and uh, being disloyal to his group uh, is how we tested this one. And the final uh, moral foundation theory uh, uh, intuition is about authority and respect that um, we generally intuit that we should obey authority in a, a sort of cross cultures. And we wondered if that were true with children as well. Did that rise to the level of moral violation? Um, and so we tested this by uh, Sally. I, I, she's, if I've used that name before, I'll use it again. Sally is, uh, is playing with her, her toys. Her mom says, it's time for dinner. Please clean up your toys before dinner. Um, and Sally doesn't do that, disobeys her mom and goes off to dinner. Is that wrong? How wrong is it? Is it if there's other countries where that's OK to do, is it wrong there? And so that's what we had the kids ask questions about. And um, so we wanted to know, of the five moral foundation theory-based scenarios, uh, will they only rate harm, care, and justice fairness as moral violations? That was one of our hypotheses, that they would rate only those, and that they'll rate all other scenarios as conventional. And that was our hypothesis going into the research. And, um, we also thought that um, children will rate the five moral foundation scenarios as more moral than the scenarios depicting the conventional. So we thought um, uh, there would maybe be this middle ground um, with the three of the five moral foundation theory scenarios. And so our sample was 47 kids. They uh, pretty evenly balanced between male and female average age between four and seven, uh, and a, a fairly s a representative sample. Um, and here are the mean ratings. Um, so harm care was the highest rated. Uh, justice fairness, the second. Purity was close to the others. Authority, the third. Um, In-group, out-group um, scenario was lower, and then the conventional violation sort of um, was at the end. So what we did was we grouped, in order to test these, we grouped the scores from what Social Moral Foundation considers wrong. We grouped them as one group. We grouped these three that had averaged these means and, and uh, ran a, an analysis, and then we took the conventional one and kept it separate. So we, on that analysis, we found uh, for all, we also divided the kids into three age groups, and all three age groups uh, rated uh, very similarly. There's no um, mean differences here, no statistical differences. And this is the moral, uh, the moral violations, that is harm, care, and justice, fairness. On the left side, the conventional violation is on the bottom, and the three sort of that we weren't sure about, the neither fish nor fowl is what I, uh, we called them, the three, the purity, sanctity, the in-group, out-group, and the authority. Um, that was rated somewhere in the middle uh, for these kids. So, and this is also, uh, by gender, we got the same results. So there appears to be justice, fairness, 
they rated the scenarios about justice, fairness, and, um, and uh, harm care as the most, uh, the most moral violations, the highest moral violations. The conventional were not considered moral violations. And then the three other ones, purity, sanctity, and group, out group, and um, authority, respect, fell somewhere in the middle. So uh, that, that was our results um, from, from that study. So now we have these scenarios to, to tell the kids um, and ask them whom do they trust. And that, uh, Matt's going to tell you about that part of the study. Okay, so I'll take you through the second part of the study, or the second study, uh, and um, you'll see, keep, keep those kind of categories in mind, or keep, keep the uh, kind of differences in terms of moral severity of the, those different scenarios, because we're using those again, and they ended up kind of coming out a little bit differently, and I've labeled them here, but, but just try to keep those in mind uh, as we move forward. <clears throat> so uh, for the second study, as Peter said, our, our Hypotheses, or what we were trying to get at, is uh, we thought that children's decisions to trust information from an, uh, from an informant uh, was going to be influenced by the severity of the kind of violation that they committed. Uh, so we expected the kind of firm moral violators, the harm care violators, to be significantly less trustworthy than somebody who walks to school in their pajamas. Uh, we thought that that would kind of uh, turn out in the same way in terms of the, the level of, of moral severity. Um, so and specifically, again, we, we, we thought that it would correspond to those ratings that we got earlier. So the more morally severe, the less trustworthy we thought we thought we'd see. <clears throat> Different sample, 22 kids um, from local schools in the Pasadena area. So just as a kind of review, here are the different violations that we found uh, from study one, uh, listed in order. And what we did is, when we read the children the scenarios in the second study, uh, we gave them 15 total pairs, which accounted for all of these different comparisons. Uh, so we read the harm care violation, we compare it against the justice fairness, and so on and so on and so on, until all of the violators were compared with each other. So now, uh, I've left this rank order in to these next slides so that you can see the comparison of, of how they came out. <clears throat> so this is what uh, basically our procedure looked like. We would sit down, we would put out the different cards of the different scenarios, and we would say, this boy Joey dropped an apple in the garbage, he dug around in the wet slimy garbage for the apple, he finds the apple and decides to eat it, he does not wash the slime off before eating the apple. Uh, this is a girl named Kim. She's been playing all afternoon with her toys. Her mom comes in and says, Kim, it's time to clean up your toys. It's time to come eat. Make sure you clean up your toys before you come to dinner. Uh, and she keeps on playing and then goes off to dinner without eating or without picking up her toys. Uh, so then we said, Joey calls this ambiguous object a jarf. Uh, Kim calls it a quizzy. Who do you think is right? Uh, and then after they kind of picked whichever one they thought was more trustworthy, uh, then we asked them, so, okay, so why do you think that? Why did you pick Kim instead of Joey? So our kind of proxy for trustworthiness score uh, was the average number of times a person chose the violator's name over another violator. Uh, so we had 22 different uh, participants. Um, so they could have chosen a particular case up to 22 times, or a particular person could have been chosen up to 22 times. Uh, and then a score of 11 meant that basically it's 50%. Uh, this person got chose just as much as anybody else. Um, they're not any necessarily more trustworthy than anybody else. <clears throat> so here are the means, and you can kind of see if 11 is your uh, proxy for about 50-50, uh, that the people up here were uh, less trustworthy uh, overall and the people down here are rated as more trustworthy, uh, at least more than 50-50. So you can see based on how the, I mean, I, again, I put those rankings in from our first study. It didn't come out exactly as our first study showed. Um, the purity sanctity folks 
while they were kind of in that middle group in our first study, ended up coming out as being the least trustworthy. Um, I noticed in your reactions as Peter was reading the story that I had the kind of most gut reaction to it. So I, I think that held true with some of our kids as well. Uh, you don't want to trust uh, the folks that are digging around in garbage. You would trust the people that pushed uh, the other kids down over the people who dug around the garbage. So, uh, so that, that seemed to stand out. <clears throat> um, when we did a comparison of these, I'll show you the statistical differences, um, it ends up that the bottom group, the bottom three are significantly different than, than the top. Um, our sample size was fairly small, so we imagine that if we had kind of a higher N, uh, we might see some, some of these differences become st statistically significant. But, <clears throat> um, so yeah, here's a just visual representation of the difference uh, overall. Purity folks, you got cut off a little bit. <clears throat> so then what we wanted to do, just to try to kind of clarify, um, previous research has uh, looked into the different ways of reasoning morally uh, based on gender. Um, this is the kind of Kohlberg versus Gilligan debate in uh, psychology circles. Um, and uh, Gilligan basically said, well, females look at kind of moral uh, reasoning a whole lot different. They have different kind of priorities when it comes to understanding moral goods as they develop. <clears throat> so we wanted to just take a look at um, oh, that's the kind of statistical differences from the first sample or from the overall. So we want to look at males versus females. Uh, and you'll notice that they came out a little bit different uh, in kind of some nuanced ways. The purity was still kind of at the bottom for males. You still didn't want to trust the uh, people digging around in trashes. But uh, authority was also then became a kind of, uh, for males, if you kind of break authority, that's something that uh, really diminishes your trustworthiness. <clears throat> um, but if you stole somebody's apple and ate it, it wasn't that really that big of a deal. Uh, in fact, you're more trustworthy than the people who wore pajamas to school, um, which was uh, kind of interesting. And I'll, I'll describe some of the reasoning that kids said they had for some of these things, and, and that might make it a little bit more clear. <clears throat> so here are the means there. And it turns out that the, for the males, the top two, the conventional and the fairness, uh, violations, violators were significantly more trustworthy than the authority and purity violators. <clears throat> so then females, and you'll see that there's a little bit of a difference here in terms of the females. Uh, so similar with what uh, Gilligan said is that females are a little bit more sensitive to the kind of harm care issues that when they saw Tyler pushing Sally down, that that was a cue for them. This person is not trustworthy. Um, whereas for the males, it kind of wasn't as big of a deal. Um, you still saw kind of purity sanctity being a kind of uh, thing you wanted to avoid. Um, wearing PJs was a little bit more important for the, for the girls. You wouldn't want to wear PJs. That's going to really hurt your uh, reputation. <clears throat> um, and then uh, the authority, you know, whereas with the males, it was all the way at the top. Uh, with the females, you know, you could kind of not listen to mom, and, and that was kind of okay. Didn't affect your trustworthiness. Um, the in-group loyalty one is, is interesting. Um, the, the kind of high-five that you saw in that scenario, that was the tug-of-war one, where he then went and kind of high-fived the other person. And some of the descriptions there were... Uh, you know, oh, he, he won because you know, he did the, the right thing. He got to go high five the other team. So he's the kind of cool kid who kind of knew what he was doing or something like that. So we think some of that might have gotten in the way. It wasn't always that they reasoned that way, but some people said, oh, wow, that's, uh, you know, that's the neat thing. He must be the trustworthy guy. Um, so that's why we think it, it, it ended up being a little bit higher than some of the others with, with some of these cases. So there are the means there. Uh, and again, the top two being significantly higher than the bottom two. That's the stats. Uh, so just in conclusion, our order didn't line up exactly in terms of study one. So for us, that, that means uh, this, uh, th there's a relation between moral violations and trust. 
And you can see some of that coming out, but it, it doesn't kind of map on directly in terms of uh, just because someone does something bad doesn't necessarily mean that you're automatically not going to trust them. Uh, it does mean that you're less likely to trust them, but it doesn't automatically mean it. There's some other things kind of going on in that process. I highlighted some of the gender differences in terms of influencing um, kids' decisions to trust. Uh, and then what we saw in terms of when we asked about the why question, what, what was kind of going on, why did you decide uh, Kim over uh, Joey, uh, some of the answers really were right on in terms of our hypothesis. Uh, you would trust Kim over Joey because Joey is nasty. Um, and, and so there was a clear sense in which uh, the moral violation directly impacted, well, I do not want to trust him. Uh, I don't want to go near him. Uh, but then there are others, uh, like I kind of alluded to with the in-group example, that kind of contradicted our hypothesis. Uh, why would you trust Tyler? Oh, because you know, Tyler was the person who shoved Sally down. Oh, well, you trust Tyler because he got away with it. But there was something about his ability to kind of man manipulate authority or something that uh, for some kids was a sign of, okay, this is the person that you should trust. Um, and then some, it was, seemed to be completely unrelated to their moral violation. It was just, uh, why did you think that? Mm, what did he call it? Jar? He called it a kluzi? Well, I think kluzi, this sounds like a kluzi. I think this is a kluzi. Uh, it looks like a kluzi or something like that. And that was just you know, merely based on the sound of the name and what can I imagine this would kind of sound like. OK, I'll go with that. It seemed to be completely unrelated to the moral scenario. Um, so what was, what was interesting, and I think what I'll close with, um, is just that, that we saw some of the evidence here of, of Haidt's descriptions of how we kind of work uh, intellectually in terms of making sense of things, uh, that there is a kind of post hoc process for kind of why we do what we do. Uh, I mean, sometimes we would ask them, you know, Why'd you pick this? You know, oh, that's, oh, I'm going to pick this other person. And there seemed to be a very clear intuition in terms of there's something about the violation that's going to make me want to go with the other person. But then we'd ask them, oh, so why, why did you choose that person? And they'd go, because um, um, it kind of sounds like the right name or something like that. And, and you're like, well, no, like I could kind of see in your process that it was the violation that was pointing you over there. Uh, but sometimes their ability to kind of think and reason and make sense of that and verbalize that between the ages of four and seven uh, wasn't quite there. So we, again, saw some of that intuitive thinking kind of powering some of these decisions uh, and not so much the kind of rational process. So that's it. <laughs>
the conventions, if you if there were different kinds of Depending conventions, kind like of crazy of ideas, crazy behavior, and in fact, eating out of the dumpster is sort of crazy behavior. It's disgusting behavior, yeah. but it's also crazy behavior. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It violates the convention we have about where you get where you source your food or what's. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm, I'm yeah. kind of getting at here? Yeah. And so I, I kind of think. Um, I mean, I, I just I might have had different predictions. I mean, it, you know, yours kind of lined up nicely, but I also think. You're sort of choosing those kinds of things that um, are going to lend itself to that. Yeah, I like that so uh, uh, a lot. Of what you're saying, uh, these, these, this is kind of pilot work. I mean, we're, yeah. we're sort of testing these scenarios, and we, we took some of the classic from Smetha uh, uh, et al. and uh, the social mo uh, moral theory. But um, I think that's right. And yeah. We didn't get a clear, because of, of Heights Moral Foundations, we're sort of neither fish nor fowl. It's hard to call them social uh, violations. It's also hard to call them moral violations in a way. Well, if you get to things like cheating, which is like a combination of convention, because nothing's ever purely cheating. It always depends on mm -hmm. the convention that's set out yeah. as to whether somebody's really cheating or not. So whether you take a note card into exam, whether that's cheating or not, really depends on what, what the consensus is. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's conventional, but people, I think, have a moral belief about that. So about there's all these stuff, ones yeah. that are kind of in there that yeah. are mixtures. Um, yeah. I Not, probably just confuse the thing. I'm sorry. They yeah. probably confuse things more, but I think they're interesting no. because I think probably kids yeah. do have strong intuitions about yeah. these things. Well, you got at the difficulty of, of some of the comparisons, of some of the kind of combinations of these things. We threw out a number of these. We had more than six initially. We had 10 plus kind of examples. And what we found, one of the examples was somebody who uh, gets a gift from their parents or their grandparents and doesn't say thank you, just kind of takes it and opens it and kind of leaves. And the, the grandparents are kind of like, you could tell they're kind of sad. Uh, and we thought that that was a kind of convention of, well, you're, you know, you're supposed to say thank you when like, you get a gift. Like politeness sort of not, yeah. Exactly. But, but we, what we got in terms of the responses, okay, well, why is that a bad thing? A lot of them would say, oh, because they hurt grandma and grandpa's feelings. So it became a kind of harm care violation that, that then wasn't as, as kind of clear. It would follow up. It, related to this, I, I think there are two different reasons not to trust someone. Mm -hmm. One is because they're incompetent. Yeah. And one is because they're deceitful. They can be hyper-competent. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think in some cases when people violate conventions, or, 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 or something which has huge consequences is just stupid to do it, like eating the apple out of the mm -hmm. trash at the diver. That can make you think they're don't trust them at all. They might be good hearted. Yeah. But yeah. They're they're real they're, they're real they're real stupid. Yeah. And, and yeah. in the other case, this person might be brilliant, but the kid who pushes the other kid down the line, but he's gonna violate privacy and norms to serve his own ends, and so don't trust him because he's out to deceive you. Yeah. So so I think those cross cut across yeah. some of your other dimensions yeah. and you might want to kind of control them. Yeah, yeah. I see that. Thanks. John. Yeah, so actually, actually the question I was gonna ask can be a follow up to this one because it seems like Understanding it, understanding that trust uh, or trustworthiness is typically seen as involving both competence and goodwill. Um, the kids who sh seem to show incompetence would not be trustworthy, but it seems like the way it was phrased as a so and so calls this a so and so rather than they're coming up to you and telling you, hey, this is a such and such. It could be that you're that what I'm, I'm just wondering, could sure. the kid perceive it as you're telling them what this person believes, and if they seem intelligent, even if they're not moral? You might think, well, they're competent with respect to intelligence, so maybe yeah. they got the right name. Whereas if the person were to come up and say, hey, this is a such and such, maybe they would be, maybe they would be less inclined to actually believe them. Um, I want, so that was a question that occurred to me. Mm -hmm. I don't have any strong opinions. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it was tough to decide how exactly to ask who do you think is right or who do you trust or. And all of the scenarios where I think you're, you're going to get at a little bit different things, and to just call it kind of trustworthiness is maybe kind of too simple of a term. Um, luckily, we had uh, Ian there to help us kind of try to navigate some of those waters. But I mean, it was just kept being like, well, if we do this, we're going to lose this. And if we do this, we're going to lose this. And none of it is kind of getting at exactly what, um, what we want or what we need. And I think you're touching on that exactly. A lot of these uh, comments have to do with sort of other factors that might be, I, I suppose you could take this down with your manipulation, like yeah. how smart uh, your child yeah. is, a uh, person is versus dumb, or uh, one I would have to be thinking of is what affective state gets elicited or how arousal inducing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some evidence that suggests that high levels of arousal um, can increase moral condemnation, even uh, right. positive arousal or negative arousal. So there's all this 
that was equally arousing, maybe that would have changed your effects, or yeah. you, know, you kind of try to deal with it. It sounds like it's really hard to control for a lot of these other variables. Some of them inherently you probably can't because some sorts of variables are inherently going to be part of that type of moral violation. I think mm -hmm. certain affects are, you know, disgust is supposed to be in an affect that's elicited right. by a purity violation, but not some of the other violations. So that would be compatible with the purity. I don't know if you want to get rid of that yeah. compound. It's sure. part of what you mean by right. that type of violation. Right. But some others you might want to control for. Yeah. yeah. Good. You know, Thanks. Good. I just have another, another yeah. point. I just wanted you think you might think about doing with, with all of these, which I think is really important for, for kids because I think for kids because they do start to have this positivity bias and I've often found that even when somebody does something terrible once, they always have the expectation that the next day that person could be great mm -hmm. or wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. you know, you may not trust them that day, but and, and I think that's one of the things that kills parents because somebody could be bully your child and you just oh don't ever play with that kid again. And the next day your child comes home and says, oh, this person's my best friend. Yeah. And they have a totally oh. different view of that child, whereas you still see that child in a very fixed way. Yeah. So it might be helpful to actually have the person engage in those kinds of violations again and again and again. Yeah. So it's not just once that they pick up that apple, but every time you know, they steal all the time, or they're always eating things out of the dumpster, or they're always wearing their pajamas to school. Because yeah. you might think, oh, they do it once just to be different. Yeah. But if they're doing or it they all thought the time, it was pajama day that or person's something. just yeah. really, yeah, they, like, they were yeah. just mistaken. They you just know, were pajama, confused. Pajama yeah. day does happen, you know? So, yeah. But if they do it all the time, then you start to think, ah, this person really isn't somebody I would put my faith in. Sure. Um, yeah, so maybe to have this happen is Cool, thanks. Yeah, I, think, I, I think one of the <clears throat> results of the study is, is it wasn't as simple as, you know, we certainly tested. Yeah. But, you know, but, clear conclusion. It sort of points to the pilot nature of it. And, you know, we, we piloted on the scenarios, but I think we do need to go back and do some more piloting. I do think we need to think more about what are the actual issues. We thought it might just be this simple, but it, it turns out it's not. So that's the conclusion. Um, you mentioned sometimes when you ask the kids what mileage they're Yeah, you know, it happened. Uh, I don't have like an exact kind of statistic or whatever, but it happened more often than I expected, yeah. given the nature of the moral violations. It, 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 sometimes it lined up with, okay, this person did this, okay, this person did this. Well, I'm just going to think of what the right name is. But there were other times where you could kind of see clearly a kind of affective reaction, and then they said, oh, well, it's the name or something like that. I'm worried about the other direction, though, where it actually yeah. really is the name driving the response, and then yeah. they, they, so they never really just worry about the person, or they're, they're confused, and they're, because they're trying to articulate something they're not quite sure about. So yeah. I'm wondering if, if you could just, this might be some of the confound you can worry about, and yeah. the way to do that is instead of saying, Joey says this word, Susie says this word, you say, Joey and Susie disagree with what this is called, which one would you like to ask? Yeah. So don't, so don't nice. tell the kids which names the two nice. characters yeah. give, but say which of these two characters would you like to ask, and you can only ask one, and they'll tell you what name it is. Yeah. Yeah, because there's, I mean, there's, there's, I think some of these names sound more nonsensical than yeah. some of the other ones, and we didn't, we, we didn't kind of go through and kind of get ratings on those initially and make sure they were all about the same rating, and I think there might be some of that that's yeah, a part yeah, of the company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. Other questions? So this, this is definitely a philosopher's question. Yes, uh, bring it. So, the, um, so you use the term epistemic trust. In, in philosophical literature, when we talk about epistemic trust, there's usually a, a distinction made between merely relying on someone and trusting someone, where trust involves uh, a degree of like optimism or you know expectation of success in the particular instance, whereas you might rely on someone because you have to. But, and when it comes to epistemic trust, it's trust with respect to one's beliefs. And it seems like you can only call it epistemic trust when there really is that optimism that, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm getting the truth as opposed to, well, this is just the best I have to go on. Sure, sure. So the philosophical question is like, well, yeah. it doesn't seem like this distinguishes between merely relying on someone because it's the best you have to go on and epistemically trusting the sense of actually coming to believe what, mm -hmm. they're, what they're saying. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, but I can see how that would be a lot harder to test. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's like in sort of psychometrically, you have to do a forced choice. You kind of have to set these somewhat artificial situations up, and it might 
it is, that's a good distinction for us to think as we're moving forward. To, and maybe just asking them who would be the most reliable on the name as opposed to saying you have to depend on one of these um, for the name. You, it might get a little better uh, clear that distinction up. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's, I mean, we're trying to get at, I think, one piece of what makes up epistemic trust and hoping that moral violations are kind of one piece of that, or wondering if, one, if they're one piece of that, but I think you're right. But it, it doesn't like it would predict, like if you see like, well, this one's more, you know, more likely or more trustworthy than the other one, at least you're headed in that direction. Right? Yeah, that there's, this kind of is in there somewhere, but, but yeah, I think there's a whole lot, and, and maybe some of their, their descriptions of why they trusted kind of went beyond the examples themselves, um, which is kind of getting, I think, some more of that piece. Other questions? Going on the point earlier about um, deceitfulness and confidence being two distinct components of trust, yeah. I was wondering if you could. I, it seems like the name really, um, the name for an object really is mainly about confidence. Um, it doesn't seem like much motive for these kids to be lying to you about mm -hmm. the name for an object. Sure. So I wonder if you could have a second condition where the, the thing that the trust is about um, clearly highlights deceitfulness rather than confidence. So it's something where it's just really clear that both of the characters would know the correct answer, okay. um, but they might have a motive to not tell the, the person that did it, the kid did it. So I'm not sure how to do that. It's something about um, yeah. an object that's been hidden, and you're trying to figure out the object was hidden, and both these people saw where it was hidden, and yeah. they're telling you different things about where it was hidden, yeah. and which one, which one would you ask for where to look for the object. And it's an object that everyone would want to have, and sure. would, want, would, would want to be the one to know about it. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. That's nice. Yeah. I know. We've <laughs> had these meetings before. Uh, yeah, yeah, but also, again, we, we had this intuition. I think that the finding really is uh, this is complicated. We need to yeah. step back and uh, how far we are. You know, it appears to fit. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's uh, thank our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.